Okay, proceeding on with supply and demand, uh, we have our falling demand curve and the vertical supply line, like so, and uh, intersecting at the market equilibrium price, with the price on the y axis, quantity on the x axis. And now we come to a uh, second fig figure two, where we now see what happens when, uh, how we get to the famous forward sloping supply curve that all of you are probably familiar with. The, uh, <clears throat> the forward sloping supply curve in the textbooks are, are, is really strictly uh, mathematically incorrect. So what it really does is present you a uh, long run locus of what's going to happen uh, after adjustments can be made. In other words, after months and years of adjustments in the production system. For example, supposing we have uh, widgets. Widgets are a great hypothetical uh, uh, product of some, somebody the only economists like to talk about. Uh, Non-existent hypothetical, <coughs> therefore has no properties. All right, and uh, this is the demand curve for widgets and the supply line for widgets. The two million widgets being produced every year, and this is the equilibrium price. And then something happens. All of a sudden, there's a big increase, let's say, in the demand for widgets. Uh, it could be because uh, the leaders, the social leaders of the, of the country or the world, uh, all of a sudden take to widgets in a big way. And, and Willie Stargell says, I smoke widgets or I wear widgets, whatever it is. And the Queen of England likes it, and so forth and so on. There's a big increase in the demand for widgets. So what you have then is an increase of the demand curve upward. Uh, the demand curve shifts to uh, the dotted line here, B prime, <coughs> which means that at any given price, more of the widgets will be purchased than before. But everybody wants more widgets now. The value scales have a higher, of most people, or all people have a higher ranking for widgets than they have before. So this means that initially, in other words, when a big initial push comes for widget demand, uh, there's only this million widgets around, or a million cases, or whatever they're sold in, uh, and the price suddenly goes up. Because of the old price, uh, as you remember, remember from the <coughs> market quote mechanism, unquote, uh, which the old price cleared the market before, now we suddenly find a situation where at the old price, the demand is much greater than supply, but now the demand curve has shifted upward and to the right. So all of a sudden, a sudden a shortage of widgets develops at the old price. And widgets leave the shelves very quickly, and, and, and the sellers and businessmen raise the price. And as the price of widgets goes up, the shortage is eliminated. And finally, we get the new equilibrium price, say E2. Okay, that's what we, what we mentioned last week, where <coughs> the increase in demand will give us initial push and will. Uh, uh, People evaluate the widgets more highly, and therefore the price will go up. The next step, so that's phase one, so to speak, in the, in the widget price question. The next step is what happens now? Well, in some things, of course, nothing happens now. I think in, 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 so in products where there's only where you can't have any increase in supply because because uh, all of the all of the possible supply was produced a hundred years ago, or so. For example, Rembrandt's. It's impossible to increase the supply of Rembrandt unless you're a very, very good forger and the forger remains undetected forever. Barring that, supply of Rembrandt will remain forever the same. In other words, the supply curve will be fixed. <coughs> and the only possible way to go is to go downward if you know, some Rembrandt uh, gets lost or something like that. So in the case of Rembrandt's, there'll be an increase in demand for Rembrandt's, uh, increase in the price of Rembrandt's, and that'll be it. And the Rembrandt's will then be allocated again to their most value holders, so to speak. Those will be willing to pay more, more for, for them. Uh, <coughs> so in the case of Rembrandt, there's not, not much more you can do. Uh, <coughs> and you just say that this is the supply line for Rembrandt, and that's the end of it. But in the case of any product which can be increased in production, such as widgets, then the widget manufacturers uh, start getting very busy. And all of a sudden see an increase in demand for widgets. They say, oh boy, yippee. Well, widgets are here again, and so forth. And they start increasing. They start tooling up and increasing the supply of widgets. Now, how long this will take depends on the data of the individual product. <coughs> uh, the, for example, in the, the late unlamented uh, meat shortage this spring, one of the problems there was it takes a couple of years to, to uh, increase the supply of beef because cows, the production process for cows, 
takes a couple of years, whereas for chickens, it only takes a few months. So this is a technological production process. <clears throat> so in the case of wedges, whether it's a couple of months or a couple of years, depending on the situation, uh, new manufacturers enter the widget field, old manufacturers expand their production, uh, repair the rusty locks and go into business and so forth. And over the years then, or over the months, we begin to have a shift in the supply lines, the vertical supply line of widgets, rightward. So after a few months, we may have this much, and after some more months, that much, <coughs> and so forth. So let us say that after a couple of years, we now have uh, this, uh, say, SF final supply, or presumptuous, let's say, final supply line. We now have the current situation, the phase, after phase two, in other words, after the uh, supply is increased and, and, and in response to the great increase in widget demand, we now have a new equilibrium point, E3, which is the intersection of the new demand curve, D prime, with the final sub vertical supply line. <coughs> in other words, <coughs> after a few years, uh, after widget prices, after widget manufacturers retool, enter the widget business once more, uh, we have an increase in the supply of widgets in response to the increase in demand. So in this way, demand is able to call forth its own supply, so to speak. Uh, in response to the incentives due to the higher prices, uh, businessmen expand their production of this particular product, and the price then falls back from E2 and onto some intermediate point, E3. The forward sloping supply curve, which we're most of us familiar, takes the locus of all these changes, all these responses of supply, and uh, connects them all together in the, in the famous, our famous supply curve. S, uh, SL, I think, in the long run. Uh, in, other words, with the long, in other words, what we're dealing here with, the forward supply curve is a long run supply curve, which answers a very different question than the man curve. The man curve says, uh, how much of any, of any particular product will, the, will the consumers buy at any given time? The man curve freezes the, freezes the market at any, like a, a free shot in the movies, uh, at any given moment, and at that moment, how much will be bought in given hypothetical prices. So the demand curve is, is instantaneous, <coughs> the snapshot kind of figure, whereas the supply curve, the forward sloping supply curve, is really a long run curve incorporating time within it, uh, which says uh, how much, how many widgets will be produced, will be called forth on the market given this particular price. In other words, given a very low price, we only have a few widgets being produced. Given a higher price, more widgets will be produced. Giving a very high price, an enormous amount of widgets will be produced, and so forth. So what we have with the supply curve is something which really technically should not be on the same graph as the demand curve, because what it tells us is it incorporates time within it. And it says, given time for adjustment, given time for response, given time for the widget manufacturers to either get out of the industry if prices are too low or get in if prices are high, this will be how much uh, production will be called forth. But it's still very, even though it's technically incorrect, it's still interesting to contemplate it because it's a valid way of looking at the situation because it shows that, uh, how supply responds to the changes in demand. And similarly, of course, if demand falls, people get sick of widgets. If Queen Elizabeth or Willie Stargell so, so, you know, announce the fact that they hate widgets now, and the demand curve for widgets drops, we have the exact opposite situation. We have a sudden drop in prices, <coughs> followed by people getting out of the widget industry and winding up with a, uh, prices going back to some extent and, and winding up with just a few widget manufacturers, like the horse and buggy manufacturers. There's still a few horse and buggy manufacturers left. And obviously, it's way, way less than the heyday of the old, you know, the pre automobile heyday of the buggy industry. So, um, so in this way, consumers, by their changes in demand, are able to, to direct and redirect product factors of production, land, labor, capital, investments, uh, energy, and so forth, direct and redirect them into those areas where consumers would like want uh, products, where the demand uh, is most urgent or highest, such as, say, widgets, and out of those areas where the consumers no longer wish to buy stuff, such as, whatever, hula hoops. <coughs> and, uh, and so uh, this way, consumers are able to direct production uh, out of those areas which they're not particularly interested in, into those areas where they are interested, where they, are, where they do want to uh, acquire as much product as they can. <coughs> uh, 
In the case of, in the case of, uh, example, uh, beef and pork, which we'll get, get to in a minute again, uh, beef is notoriously income elastic. In other words, as people get more affluent, as people get more affluent, the demand for beef relatively increases. And as people get more affluent, the demand for pork relatively declines. They might want to, still want to have more pork, but the proportion of income they want to spend on pork tends to fall. There's a, sh there's a shift from pork and into beef. Uh, the result of which is, is again, uh, in the long run, resources are shifted. Farmers begin to shift their resources from pigs and into cows in response to this, to this general change. Uh, and this is why we can say that, that consumers really direct production. Consumers are really in charge uh, of production rather than the entrepreneurs who looks as if superficially in the, in the short run are in charge. <coughs> consumers have to pay for the product. Uh, so if, if, for example, if, if, if this vertical supply line represents a, a current codfish catch and the fish are down there on the dock and uh, they're, they're sold fairly quickly, etc. If the price of demand for codfish goes up, and next year the fishermen will go out and they'll shift more into codfish and out of other fish or out of other things. And so the next season or two seasons later, they'll bring in more codfish, as, as, as demonstrated by the shift in the supply curve, and then we'll have an increase, a permanent increase in the quantity of codfish and a drop back to the somewhere in the middle of the price structure. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's see what we can do. Let's see the sort of thing that he, he, what he, economists, how economists can, can predict or explain a, a given price. Um, for example, we can, ex we can predict what's going to happen on the auction market. We can't make a quantitative prediction. We can't make a qualitative prediction. This is, this I think, is indicative of what axiology, so to speak, can say of the auction market. On the auction market, we have a supply curve of one. Supply, supply line, say, one. In the case of Rembrandt's or Chippendale's, and that's it. There's no way of increasing it. But aside from the question of increasing it, we have a supply line of one, and we can say that the price of the auction will be set at the Park Burnett Galleries or wherever, uh, somewhere slightly above the maximum buying price of the second highest valuer. That's what we can say. Uh, so that if if Rockefeller and Vanderbilt are bidding for, for the next Rembrandt, and Rockefeller, we get down to, we start with 100 bidders, as we work our way up, we have, we all drop out of the demand curve, and we're left in Rockefeller and Vanderbilt. <coughs> <coughs> Rockefeller is able to outbid Vanderbilt. <coughs> in that case, Rockefeller will be bidding, will be paying just a little bit higher than the highest price that Vanderbilt was willing to pay. That's what we can say. And we, it's not, uh, it's, in one sense, it's not very much. On that basis, we can't predict tomorrow's auction market. On the other hand, we can say something. That's what, that's, that's what we can say. We can, we can analyze the, on the basis, price on the basis of supply line and, and value scales. <coughs> uh, there is a, another area, another uh, room for, su for supply, for forward sloping supply curves, which I don't want to get into too much. But just to mention, uh, and that's speculation. The influence of speculation in markets where we can have speculation. You can't always have speculation, obviously. You're not going to usually have speculation, say, in the Wheaties market. Because it, it, speculation is usually in a commodities, which are not brand names, which are certain fixed properties, and so forth and so on. Uh, in markets where you do have speculation, you have a, the influence of speculation is to enormously speed up the, the adjustment process, toward equilibrium. So that instead of having and the man curve, the regular falling demand curve on, say, a vertical supply line, you'll have a, a very flat curve, both demand and supply. Because since the speculators are usually a pretty astute in knowing what's going, what's going to happen, not, not perfect, but they can usually fairly well guess where the intersection point is going to be, then if the price is, is, is considerably below what they, where they think it's going to be, they're going to buy a lot of it and sell very little of it because they expect the price to go up. And this, in this way, they're going, to have a very, they're going to have a big gap between demand and supply, a big shortage, so to speak. And the price will scoot upward very quickly. On the other hand, <coughs> the price is above the, what they think is going to be equilibrium price. They're going to sell a lot of it, and they're going to buy very little. As a result of that, it's going to be a big surplus, and the, and the uh, price is going to scoot back down to equilibrium very quickly. So the result of speculation 
even though it's a very malign occupation, usually. <clears throat> Most people don't understand, don't understand the economic function of speculation. But the economic function of speculation is to speed up the adjustment process <clears throat> on the market to the equilibrium level. <clears throat> Those speculators get caught and guess incorrectly, of course, lose out, find, find themselves in unsold stocks, etc. And so the result of this is to and, uh, those people who are lousy speculators uh, drop out of the market, and those people who are good speculators continue on. And the tendency then is to have sort of crackerjack speculators doing very well in adjusting the high system. <coughs> uh, also, speculators will do things like buying in a uh, buying when something is in, uh, in relative abundance, when a commodity is relative abundance now, holding it until it's going to be in short supply later. Uh, and say in some say the strawberry season or something like that, holding until it's out of season and then selling it uh, at that point. By doing this, the speculator tends to smooth out the fluctuation of, of prices by you know, raising the price during the abundant, relatively abundant season and lowering it during the relatively scarce season, and thereby shifting the supply to where the consumers more demand it. In other words, the consumers more anxious to get it, say during the out of season, so the speculator holds on to it and then sells it at that, that point and smooths out the process there. So the speculators perform a very important function. <clears throat> okay, uh, there are various types. This, this is essentially the economics of the individual price, uh, both in the immediate run for the vertical supply line and the longer run uh, as the forward sloping supply curve takes into account all the various adjustments. We now get to the question of the relationships between prices, between different products. The first place is a general relationship between all prices, that all goods are competing for the consumer dollar. In that sense, all goods compete with each other, and all goods are substitutes uh, in a way for each other. <clears throat> um, and we can say that if the demand for hula hoops, for one thing we can say, something I think I mentioned last time, is when demand for hula hoops goes up, the demand for something else has got to drop because there's any of your you're paying more, you're buying more hula hoops or more widgets. It means you're spending more money on these in this product. This means that somehow you have to offset this by spending less money on something else because your consumer income is considered given. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one, one way in which all, all products are interrelated uh, on the market. But let's get a little closer, kind of closer relationships than just, than this just general competition for the consumer dollar. Basically, there are two kinds, substitutes and complements. Uh, substitutes are close substitutes in this case, not just the co competition for the consumer dollar, but uh, beef and pork, uh, butter and margarine, close substitutes. Uh, we saw the influence on, uh, of close substitutes in the late, late unlamented meat shortage. When beef is uh, extremely scarce, the price of beef is going way up in response to the scarcity, and people began to shift to substitutes for beef, lamb, uh, lamb, chicken, um, soybeans, or whatever. So, the, so all these things began to go up in demand in response to the uh, increased scarcity of the, of the substitute product. So there we begin to see that important relationships between them. Uh, okay, with substitute products, there are two kinds of uh, interrelationships. One if the demand of one changes, and the other if the supply of one changes. If the demand changes relatively to the other, there's no problem. It's very easy to see what happens. For example, the beef lamb uh, case that I mentioned before, beef pork case. If uh, as people get more affluent, usually the demand for beef goes up and the demand for pork drops. And then what simply happens is that the price of beef tends to go up, the quantity tends to go up as the resources shift into it, and the price of pork tends to fall, and the quantity of resources devoted to pork tends to fall. So that's, that's very simple. As you have a shift on the value scales, uh, from pork to beef, demand changes respond reflect that, <clears throat> and price changes and quantity changes in the long run reflect that also. So that that's simple. The couple of more complicated relation, relationships in, in the substitute field are the cases of changes in supply. For example, uh, beef pork. <clears throat> this is Figure Three. Uh, here we have two two substitute uh, supply and demand curves, say beef and pork. Now we're dealing with, with a forward sloping supply curve because we're figuring it's a long run, allowing some time for relationships to change. 
And here's a, a beef and pork. Uh, now, let's say we have the, our late unlamented meat shortage, and the supply curve of beef shifts radically to the left. Why it shifts to the left is another story, which we'll get to soon. And it could be, in the case of, a, of a, our beef shortage this year, is because the government messed everything up. It could also be, there are other possible reasons. Uh, a beef, you know, the hoof and mouth disease strikes the middle of the West, or whatever. So the big shift in the supply curve of uh, beef to the left. In that case, of course, the, the quantity of beef so drops and the price goes up. In response to that, since beef is now scarcer and more expensive, people shift. The demand for pork now goes increases. In other words, the demand curve for pork shifts to the right. So the demand for the demand curve for pork can be a response to either uh, the values for pork shifting uh, in relation to beef, in relation to anything else, or in response to the substitute relationship of price, the fact that the beef prices are getting either cheaper or more expensive. If beef, beef prices are getting more expensive, then uh, the demand curve for pork will tend to go up, as we saw happen, and the result of this will be eventually an increase in the pork price, an increase in the quantity of pork. And so we wind up, <coughs> after all this is, happens, with uh, both beef prices and pork prices going up, and the eventual result of all this. The difference being that beef, the resources devoted to beef are going down, supply of beef is going down, and the supply of pork is going up because more resources are shifting into the pork area. Uh, of course, the quantity here uh, doesn't have to be the same, doesn't have to be the same as price increase. So that will depend on the, on the flatness or steepness or elasticity, as it's called, of, of these two, these four curves. Uh, <clears throat> so, and, and the same thing happened, incidentally, with lamb and chicken, etc., and, and soybeans. Anybody eat soybeans? Uh, in, in the 1973 shortage. The tendency is for all these things, the demand curves to go up in response to the higher price of the, of the other substitute. If, on the other hand, and usually, as usually happens in the market, as things get cheaper, as productivity increases and new hormones are discovered or whatever, in that case, the opposite happens. Supply of beef shifts to the right. The price of beef gets cheaper. As the price of beef gets cheaper, because more competitive than pork, the demand curve for pork shifts to the left, declines. In other words, the price of pork declines to meet it. And the result is a shift of resources out of pork and into beef, or out of lamb and into beef. So, uh, <clears throat> so the result, the resulting price change is about similar, but the thing is the impetus is very different. Here you have the impetus coming from the change in supply, and there you have a necessity to meet the competitive uh, price of the other of the substitute. Uh, well, okay, that's the beef, pork, and substitute paper. The, sometimes, of course, you, uh, different producers try to get the government to change the, the rules of the game, so to speak. In other words, the C2 of the substitutes don't show up or are crippled. For example, for many, many years, the butter industry was trying to keep margarine, which is, of course, a big substitute for butter, trying to hobble the production of margarine, sale of margarine. And they had laws passed outlawing the, the, yellow, the coloring of margarine yellow, because margarine was originally stark white or something, and people didn't like it. I mean, they were used to the idea of spreading yellow on bread. <laughs> so uh, and this, is, this is a big deterrent. So people didn't buy, uh, didn't buy margarine for many years because it looked icky, it looked icky because the butter interests had you know, passed the law preventing them from coloring in yellow. Finally, after a titanic struggle of the margarine interests against the butter interests, the margarine interests were finally allowed to color the margarine yellow and the rest of this history. I mean, people, margarine is everywhere now. But it took many years to break margarine through this, this, this uh, political barrier. Um, okay, that's, that's substitutes. <coughs> uh, the, uh, the other big relationship between products is there, there, there are substitutes, and there are lots of substitutes all over, as you can imagine, just uh, all over the place. Uh, also in production as well as consumption, aluminum and steel, let's say, substitute for each other partially at least, and then producing a lot of things. Uh, so there are substitutes, which are related in this way. There are also, there are also complements, complements with an E, that is. Uh, complements meaning products that go together in some way. And there are two types of complementary products 
each of which are completely different. Uh, one is a pro product in joint demand, the other are products in joint supply. As I said, they're completely different. Uh, joint demand product is a product which goes together. In other words, one or two or three or four, two or three or four, let's say, products that for some reason are demanded together, that go together in, 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 in consumption. And this can be, yeah, for example, bread and butter is an excellent example. Usually, when it's, if you have an increase in the demand for sandwiches, and both bread and butter are demanded together. That's not, that's not an absolute correlation, because there's also mayonnaise and stuff, but basically there's a certain, there's a certain high correlation there between uh, demand for bread and demand for butter. Also, for example, when a, a whole activity has increased in demand, for example, there's an increase in demand for baseball, it means there's an increase in demand for baseball, gloves, bats, ball boys, uh, umpire services, stadia, the whole business, hot dog, the whole business. There's an enormous uh, series of complementary goods that go together with the whole baseball package. Uh, <clears throat> so these are, these are products in joint demand. Now again, it's easy to see the relationship on the demand side. I mean, if the, if the demand for baseball goes up, then the demand curve for baseball, for baseball gloves, for bats, for ball boys, for, for pitchers, all, all these things, the demand for all these Almost infinite number of things, not infinite, but n, n number of things goes up, and the price will tend to go up, and the quantity will tend to go up. <coughs> um, contrarily, contrarily uh, the demand for the whole thing falls. For example, bowling was in great disrepute for many years before the big post war comeback. And so the demand for bowling fell, and then the demand for pin, pin boys fell, and the demand for bowling equipment and balls and alleys and all the rest of it, and the, the all this demand. So on the impact of this fall or rise you know, depends on the, on the steepness, so to speak, of the, the different supply curves, which we'll get to later. <coughs> but um, so it's easy to see what, what the, the impact of changes on the demand side for, for joint demand product. The tricky thing, or the complicated thing, comes in changes in, in the supply side. For example, let's take bread and butter. This is, this is figure four. Uh, <coughs> price on the y-axis. On the x-axis, now we have bread and butter, and uh, now supposing there's a big increase in the supply of butter for some reason. There's a there's a big uh, increase in butter produ productivity, some some new invention, some new way of uh, producing butter, which causes an enormous increase in supply. So we have a big increase in the supply curve of butter, and the price of butter then falls starkly. What then happens on the, what's the influence on the price of demand for bread? Well, the influence is, well, not only is butter cheaper, but now sandwiches are cheaper. So sandwiches are cheaper. This will induce people to buy more bread because they want to buy more sandwiches. The result is an increase in the demand curve for bread. B prime. So, so this means that the demand curve for bread is induced by what, by what happens in the supply. Changes in the demand curve for bread are induced by what happens in the changes in the supply of its complement. It's joint demand complement. Uh, in this case, butter is much cheaper. This means that it would be a big increase in demand for bread. This means that bread becomes more expensive. As more people eat sandwiches, supply the quantity produced and sold of butter increases. The quantity produced and sold of bread increases. More people will wind up eating sandwiches. But the net result of this whole business is the price of butter falls and the price of bread goes up. Because nothing is happening to see the supply of bread. There's no, there's no increase in bread productivity or technology or anything. Bread is still cooking along the same way it had been before. And all that happens now is an increase in demand for bread, so you're going up the given supply curve, you get this kind of a relationship. And again, vice versa. If there's a, if there's a big uh, cow shortage for some reason, if there's a big you know, dairy, dairy cattle is struck by the dread brucellosis disease or something, and half of dairy cattle are wiped out, supply curve of butter shifts to the left, butter becomes more expensive, and people then cut down on their purchase of sandwiches, as they do that, the demand curve for bread drops, the price of bread will fall. That's the, you know, the other side of the coin of the butter-bread relationship. So, that's the joint demand caper. And uh, I think, again, it's easy to see once, the, once it's pointed out what the relationships are uh, between products and joint demand. Uh, and it's changes from the supply side will then Read down, see what the result will be an opposite change, you know, the demand for, demand for the other uh, complement. And the same thing would happen in, in, in baseball, but there the, the effect is quantitatively so small it becomes a little bit ludicrous, but it's still there. 
I mean, for example, if there's a tremendous increase in bat productivity, the bat making, I don't know how they make bats, but presumably there's some machine that does it. If there's a big increase in bat productivity, and bats become much cheaper, the supply, supply curve for bats shifts to the right, there's a big drop in the supply of them and the price of bats. This induces more people to play baseball, and the man curves with all the other things goes up. But it's, I mean, the effect is obviously so small because the price of bats doesn't mean much in the whole baseball picture. So the, it'd just be a teeny increase in the man curve of these other things for uniforms, ball boys, and so on and so on. But qualitatively, the effect will be there. And since economics is a qualitative discipline, qualitative science, so to speak, we should mention that. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, that's the joint demand situation. Uh, and joint demand, by the way, also, of course, applies to factors of production. When, when, when widgets are produced or beef is produced or whatever, you have all sorts of factors of production, different types of labor, capital, land, etc., are jointly demanded to produce this thing. And this, so a lot of the joint demand analysis could apply there, too. If you increase the demand for steel, it'll increase the demand curves also for steel producers, steel, steel equipment. Raw steel, steel factories, the whole business, steel workers, and so on and so on. So all these things are demanded together. Okay, next, next is joint supply. Uh, joint supply is very different than joint demand. Joint supply is when two products or more products, two or more products are produced. Uh, joint demand is a situation where they're produced for the same market, you know, the baseball market, the sandwich market, or whatever. Joint supply is two things which are, have no completely different markets. It just they're technologically wrapped up together. There's no way to get around that. Uh, in other words, joint supply is a purely technological question. Uh, for example, uh, right now in the silver mine, especially in silver mines in the United States, silver and copper are wrapped up together. So when you're mining more silver, you're also mining more copper, and vice versa. Well, this means that you have a uh, peculiar kind of uh, market relationship. Um, again, in the case of in the case of joint supply, it's very easy to see what happens when there's a change this time in supply of something. In other words, if people, if the silver dash copper miners go down to Nevada or Colorado or whatever and mine more silver and copper, uh, then it's easy to see what happens. And the supply curve of silver will, gold will increase, the price of silver will fall, and, and the supply curve of copper will increase, and the price of copper will fall. And that'll be it. In other words, it'll be a uh, supply curves in both markets will increase. But the, again, the, here the, the complicated question comes, so what happens when the demand curve for one of these things goes up? For example, say this is, uh, say this is copper and silver. Actually, the famous case is, is beef and hides. Because, you know, the, the, the cow, the, the meat, meat goes to the beef market, and the hides go to the leather market. And they're two completely different markets. There's no relationship between the leather and the beef market. It just so happens it's the same thing that supplies it. So, uh, let's say you have the man and supply curves again for the two, uh, <coughs> figure four, two joint supply items, whether it's copper, silver, or beef and hides. And let's say there's a big, let's, let's take beef and hides, because there's more spectacular difference there. Uh, copper and silver, they're both mining material. Uh, let's say there's a big increase in the man for beef, as it often is. Okay, so the man for beef goes up. And in response to this, and the price of beef goes up, in response to this, in the long run supply curve, the quantity of beef increases. We have this shift from one equilibrium point to another. Okay, that's fine, but what, ha what happens here is, in response to producing more cattle, and getting more cows in the market, and, and, and responding to the increase in beef production, the result of this is that willy-nilly, and, and despite the best efforts of the producers, more hides come on the market, more leather comes on the market, the result of this is a big increase in supply curve of leather. In other words, the increase in quantity responding to the increase in the man curve for beef willy nilly depresses the leather market or you know, leads to a full supply of leather. The leather people might gnash their teeth or whatever, there's not that much they can do about it. So, this is, so again, we see sort of an opposite situation here the increase in the man evoking. Uh, greater uh, supply, which in turn uh, increases the supply curve of a complement, a joint supply complement, which lowers the price of that complement. It's the same way with copper and silver, just to hear this more dramatic uh, difference. Uh, again, contrary-wise, if there's a drop in the demand for beef, and 
The result of this is price of beef falls and more well, less cattle being produced. The result of that will be an increase in supply curve, I mean, excuse me, a, a fall in supply curve in the leather industry and a shift of leather prices upward because of this joint supply kind of situation. Uh, I'll cast the joint supply business. Um, again, in the case of joint supply, there are attempts, sometimes successful businesses, to create their own demand for the joint supply, for the, for the byproducts, of, in quotes. Uh, byproducts are often waste, uh, wasted resources which go, uh, have no use, which are no use for, but have to be produced as part of the regular production. A uh, famous case, at least famous as far as I'm concerned, uh, is a case of, of, suit of fluoridation of the water supply. Uh, I, uh, economists tend to be, I wouldn't say cynics, some, some people could say cynics, other people could say realists, in analyzing government action. We tend to look for the economic motive involved, and we tend to check if the economic motive is consistent with what happened, and also with the lobbying activity, we tend to say, well, you know, it seems to be a pretty good case here. As is true in the case of fluoridation, uh, setting aside all the arguments, the health arguments, both for and against fluoridation. Um, in the case of fluoridation, we had a, uh, a, a, an unwanted byproduct of aluminum production. Um, aluminum, uh, aluminum production also produces along with it uh, uh, sodium fluoride, unwanted, uh, un unwepped, unsung, which it was originally dumped you know, where, wherever industries dump their wastes. Uh, then the fluoridation movement comes in, and lo and behold, we have a happy, happy byproduct, a happy increase in demand for the joint supply waste product, sodium fluoride, which now gets dumped, which now gets purchased from Alcoa, and gets dumped in everybody's water supply continually. It's a, it's a continuing market. It might not seem so much, but it, it's, it's a steady thing because people are always making water and always dumping the stuff in the water supply. Okay, now if looking at this, economists looking at this situation will tend to at least hypothesize that maybe there's a certain relationship between the, the, the end for fluoridation, which suddenly appeared upon us in the late 40s uh, and early 50s, and Alcoa's need for, uh, for, extra, for extra demand for its uh, formerly waste product. Uh, and also, and I don't want to get into technical, because I'm, I'm sure people here know more about chemistry than I do, but the, there's also a peculiar thing that the, that, uh, the uh, those areas where, where water supply is naturally fluoridated, where, where kids have less cavities, these are areas where calcium fluoride is discovered in the water, not sodium fluoride. And the question arises, why isn't calcium fluoride dumped in? Well, first of all, maybe calcium is the thing that stops the cavities, not the fluorine. But at any rate, why isn't calcium fluoride dumped in the water instead of sodium fluoride? And perhaps the answer is because calcium fluoride ain't no byproduct of aluminum <coughs> production. Getting to the punchline of this, the, main, the guy who really pushed this whole thing, pushed fluoridation very heavily, was, the first, was I believe, the first Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in the Truman Administration, Mr. Oscar Ewing, who was known as a great progressive and leader of the Americas for Democratic Action and so forth. Uh, after pushing fluoridation, getting the whole thing launched and getting all the medical profession, public health profession behind it, etc., he then left the government to return to his law practice, which also happened to be uh, Chief Counsel of, partially Chief Counsel of Aluminum Corporation of America. Now, there we have it. There's the wrap up. <laughs> now, either this is, <coughs> depending on your general philosophy and point of view, either this is a pure coincidence, <laughs> or else we look, you know, we tend to look more with a jaundiced eye on this, uh, <laughs> on this so called public welfare operation. <laughs> okay, that's, um, that's the Alcoa caper. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the uh, one, free market economists are accused of being apologists for big business. I think I think we're only apologists for big business and their activities on the market, not their activities in government, where uh, a completely different set of rules and consequences follow. Uh, before I press on some more of the demand curve and supply curve analysis, I just say something about the benefits of exchange. I should have mentioned before. Uh, the exchange system is a, is a system where both parties to each exchange benefit. Actually, the, the free market economy, even though it looks to be very complex, in a sense it is, uh, consists of millions of participants, literally. It still consists of, it's really a network or a lattice work of unit exchanges of two people or two groups or two parties. So when I buy my newspaper for 15 cents, uh, 
I'm and there's me and a newspaper dealer, or if somebody works for a corporation, it's him and the corporation who are dickering for their services. Uh, so what you have is a, is a whole network of unit of these unit exchanges. In each in each case, in each unit, both parties to the exchange think that they're better off by making the exchange. In other words, uh, when I buy a newspaper for 15 cents, I value the newspaper more highly than I value the 15 cents. On my value scale, the New York Times state is higher, greater than 15 cents. On the other hand, the news dealer who has plenty of New York Times is up to up to here. New York Times is 15 cents. Obviously, is worth more to him than the New York Times. So we have a double inequality of, of values, a reverse inequality of values, which sets up the conditions for exchange. <coughs> Peculiarly enough, a lot of classical economists, including uh, especially Karl Marx, uh, looked at the exchange system, looked at prices, and said, aha, because, let's say, a newspaper is 15 cents or whatever, therefore, there must be some sort of equality of value between the newspaper and 15 cents, or, or between the newspaper and some other thing that costs 15 cents. And he looked around for what is the thing which makes these two, two things equal in value. Is it weight? No, obviously it isn't. The uh, newspaper doesn't weigh as much as half a loaf of bread or whatever. Or is it Volume couldn't be that, and he finally wound up with this crazy labor hours uh, doctrine. But, but the problem was very, very really the beginning of his questions, of his analysis, which is there must be something equal in value between two things which have the same price, because the whole point of exchanges is nobody would exchange them at all unless they were unequal in value. If I really, to me, the 15 cents was exactly equal in value with a newspaper, I wouldn't bother buying a newspaper, because it's, you know, it's a certain costliness, a certain cost involved in buying a newspaper and going there and schlepping there, etc. Uh, similarly, no, so no, no exchanges would ever take place at all if everything was equal in value. The whole point, also, if the news, if the news dealer preferred the, the ties to the 15 cents for some reason, there'd be no, there'd be no basis for exchange either. There has to be a reverse inequality. It has to be a situation where both of us have the reverse value scale for the product. So, because of this, because of these reverse uh, value scales, uh, we have exchanges all over the place where those who have sur where Cusa with a surplus fish or whatever, exchanges with a Friday surplus lumber and so forth and so on, all the way down the line. <coughs> uh, okay, proceeding on with the demand supply curve, etc. There's one famous property, and I think it's important, uh, which demand curves and supply curves both have, uh, which is important in analyzing them. Sim look, at, look at it very simplistically, it can be called a flatness or steepness. In other words, if, if, if a curve is, if the supply curve, say, is very steep and the demand curve increases, then you have a very hot, huge increase in price and a very small increase in quantity. In the case of Rembrandt, you have no increase in quantity. On the other hand, if the supply curve is quite flat, say nails, we can produce a lot more nails very quickly. Uh, then a given increase in demand will, will cause a small increase in price and a, and a large increase in quantity. So the flatness or the steepness of the demand or supply curve is uh, evidence of, of how, you know, whether, how much of the reaction takes place and will take place in the quantity area, how much will take place in the price area. Um, now the usual definition, the textbook definition, of, this is called elasticity, it's relative flatness, by the way. Of course, one very important point is that it, de it depends, you can't just say flat or steep, because that de it depends also on what the scale is here, the, the, the ordinal scale. Uh, you have to have the, the given scale before you can talk about relative flatness. But at any rate, uh, <clears throat> this is, this relative flatness is called elasticity. The term elasticity, once again, is a feeble attempt at aping physics, uh, where the where economics, e e e economics is filled with jargon. Attempting to eat the physical science, the elasticity sounds like you know, you're, you're, you're extending the spring and how much does the spring jump back. You always, the dependency is always to leave human action out of the picture, <laughs> leave people out of the picture and talking about springs and, and, uh, and weights and stuff like that. So it's illegitimate, but it's, uh, it's used anyway, so I can, with that caveat, keep using it. Uh, a usual textbook definition of elasticity is. Uh, Percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price. In other words, if the, if the quantity changes a great deal in relation to the change of price, then it's a very elastic. If the, if the quantity changes a, a, a small amount in relation to change of price, then it's very inelastic. Now, I personally don't like this definition because I don't think, well, for various reasons. For one thing, uh, which is something we have to repeat again and again in this course or any other 
economic structures is that nobody knows what the elasticity is. See, when you have, when you begin to have, if you play around with these curves, the curves take on a fascination of their own. They take on a life of their own. People actually begin to think of the curves are there and everybody knows what they are and they start trying to measure them. You can't measure them because nobody knows what they are. One, nobody knows what they are. And two, they keep changing all the time. So that there's, uh, you can't, you can't really measure them. You can try to approximate, try to figure out how elastic is a demand curve for sugar and that sort of stuff. And a, lot of, a lot of time and energy and resources and journal articles have been wasted on that sort of stuff. People come up, here's the demand curve for cotton. It's impossible to figure out what the demand curve for cotton is because the demand curve is an instantaneous demand curve and it keeps changing all the time. The, the, the so-called measurement always assumes that the demand curve stays the same for about 20 years. And then if it stays the same, then you can plot the various production points on the so-called demand curve, and this gives you the demand curve. It's a pure nonsense because the demand curve keeps changing. That's the whole basis of the whole subjective valuation of people, and these subjective valuations keep changing. So nobody knows what they are, nobody can measure them, and therefore using, start using percentages and percentage changes gives a spurious precision to the whole thing, which it really doesn't deserve. This leads the, you know, the public. But second of all, it, it, another thing this definition of elasticity does it doesn't focus on, I, I, I maintain, as an important problem of elasticity because it makes the supply curve and the demand curve similar. In other words, it, it, it looks at the steepness or flatness of both. Whereas the, the, the demand curve elasticity is a much more important question than the supply curve elasticity. And it's a very different question. See, the supply curve, uh, quantity and price are always moving together. In other words, if the quantity at the low point of supply curve, the forward sloping supply curve, price is low and quantity is low, and up here, price is high and quantity is high. So the two things are always moving in the same direction. But with the demand curve, it's completely different. The two things are always moving in the opposite direction. When price falls and the quantity of demand increases, and vice versa. So here, with the demand curve, you have a very important kind of question, which is that the area under the demand curve keeps changing in, in response to these two forces moving in opposite directions. Uh, and this area tends to be very important because that's the total revenue that business, a business or industry gets. Extremely important <laughs> to a firm or an industry to figure out whether a price change will cause a drop in revenue or, or increase in revenue. For example, uh, here's a, well, let's say we have a column. Say this is widgets. Uh, price of widgets quantity of widgets, and if the price of widgets is $10 a case, uh, quantity of widgets, say, is 1,000, people will sell 1,000. If the price drops to $9 a case, let's say they sell, sell more, we don't know how much more, let's say 1,100. I'll take 1,200 for this. All right, in that case, the total revenue is equal to the price times the quantity. Obviously, if, you, if you're selling 1,000 widgets, 1,000 cases of widgets for $10 a widget, their total income or total revenue be ten thousand uh, dollars. In this case, if you're selling uh, twelve hundred at nine dollars, and it's uh, ten thousand eight hundred dollars in total revenue. All right. So in this case, you have a situation where the price is falling and the quantity is increasing. The quantity is increasing more than the price is falling proportionally. Result of which is the total revenue is going up. In other words, the area under the curves. Uh, price and quantity, price and quantity. The area at the lower price is, is larger than the area of higher price. Okay, well this is important for a businessman to know this. If he can estimate it, it's important to figure out what's going to happen when the price falls. On the other hand, the price can fall, say, to nine dollars. Instead of going up to a thousand or to twelve hundred, it might maybe goes up only to a thousand and fifty. The, only, the quantity increases only a little bit. In that case, the total revenue would be nine thousand four hundred fifty. Okay. Uh, so the total revenue is now dropped from ten thousand to nine thousand four hundred fifty with the form and price. So here you have a situation where the area is less. The total demand curve is steeper, and the result of the fall in uh, prices. Uh, drop in total revenue. So the, so the thing, is, it's not just sort of a playing around with measurements here. The problem, the question is, what happens to total revenue if the price changes? 
the former case, I call this elastic for the price, the definition of an elastic demand curve, in my view, is when, when the price falls, total revenue goes up. On the other hand, if, if the price falls and total revenue declines, that is my definition of inelastic demand curve. So the difference, according to this definition, between an elastic demand curve and an inelastic demand curve, centers around not the percentages one way or the other, it centers around whether total revenue is going up or going down as the price falls. <coughs> uh, The, uh, <clears throat> the point is that this is not, this is not a, a given thing throughout the whole demand curve. Even if you, if you say, assuming you know what the demand curve is, just because it's elastic or inelastic in one zone doesn't mean it's going to continue to be elastic or inelastic throughout the whole area. Uh, on the other, quite the contrary. It might well happen uh, that as you keep raising the price, you're going you're to wind up probably you're going to wind up with a much lower total revenue curve. Uh, the obverse of this, by the way, the, 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 on, the other side of the coin of saying that when total, when, total revenue, when total revenue increases as price falls, that means you have an elastic demand curve. The other side of the coin of that is that when total revenue decreases as the price rises, you have an elastic demand curve. So, um, so an elastic demand curve or even like the area of the macro, I should say, is when uh, total revenue increases as the price falls, or uh, total revenue decreases as the price rises. This is, this is the same thing. And inelastic demand curve is when total revenue decreases as the price falls. And total, or total revenue increases as price rises. And you, even, even with the most inelastic demand curve, you're, never, you're not going to get a situation where you're going to raise the, the, uh, the price indefinitely and still have an increase in total revenue. Obviously, you're going to eventually wind up in the elastic zone of any demand curve. So with a, even if everybody's a great Wheaties fan, when you, when, you, when you push the pipe of Wheaties up to $10 a box, you're going to falling off the total revenue of the Wheaties. Regardless of how inelastic the, the, the makeup of Wheaties might be, if it is indeed inelastic. <laughs> now, this, this, uh, this question of elasticity and in, in, in inelasticity then becomes extremely important for a businessman or industry to figure out what's going to happen when I change, when I lower the price or raise the price. What's going to happen to total income, total revenue in this case? Um, now, for example, many disputes. Uh, We've had in New York City several taxi strikes in the last few years, beginning to blend and beginning to be a blur in my memory. But at any rate, uh, in each of these cases, usually the dispute between the taxi industry and Mayor Lindsay is revolved around the elasticity of the demand curve for taxis. Uh, the, the taxi industry has said we need a higher price and so forth and so on, and therefore we should have a 50% increase or 20% increase or whatever. And the Lindsay administration claimed that the demand curve for taxis was, was elastic. The claim was, no, no, if you increase your price by 50% or 20%, you're going to have a more than proportional dropping off of the mass so your total revenue will decline. That was essentially the Lindsay argument. Uh, and then they're fighting back and forth, and then they get the fare increase. Now, so far, the Lindsay administration has been incorrect. In other words, so far, we've had a, we've had a, we've been in an elastic, in, excuse me, inelastic demand zone. Uh, so as the total, as the fare, the price is going up, total revenue is going up. Uh, however, the last time they had a taxi fare increase, which was a huge whopper, remember about 50%, we almost got, it was a beautiful and glorious thing to watch, we almost got to the point of elasticity. But as in many taxi drivers report after many months that their, their income went down because their, you know, they were, they were, they were dropped, they, the, the fare went up at 50%, but their, their uh, number of fares went down by 60% or whatever. So in other words, we were almost, we were sort of at the, at the critical point there of, uh, of elasticity. Uh, and uh, the, the interesting point here is that the government, uh, or government regulated industry in this situation doesn't know what in blazes to do about it. Will not know what in blazes to do when they reach this glorious elastic point. 
Now, someday this will come. Someday when they raise the, the subway fare to a dollar or ten dollars, whatever it's going to be, they're going to find out when they raise it that the, that the total revenue has gone down. Uh, because the tendency of most, despite my thing about the Lindsay administration, the tendency of most government agencies is to, is to assume that the demand curve is vertical. That's really their tendency. So they, if they want a 20% increase in revenue, they figure, all right, we'll raise the fare by 20%. And they tend not to think about the falling off in quantity. <clears throat> it has an enormous falling off in quantity, which I have the figures with me, falling off in quantity of subway fares in New York City since 1948 or whenever they, they changed the nickel fare. Uh, in other words, the number of fares, even though the population has gone up since, since some extent anyway, since 1948, and the number, certainly in the metropolitan area, and income has gone up, and inflation and all that, despite that, the number of subway, subway rides has gone down considerably by, by many percent since 1948. And this is another thing that people don't realize. They figure, well, people have to ride to work and therefore there can't be any dropping off of subway fare. Not true. There's all sorts of ways you can ride less than the subway. You go shopping once a week instead of twice a week or whatever. You cut down the number of movies outside the neighborhood. There's all sorts of subtle and, and marginal ways in which the public can cut down their Subway consumption, and the result is a big whopping change in the number of fares. Well, so far, this drop in quantity has not been, has not reached the elastic zone yet, but my prediction is that it will. Uh, as I say, some, some glorious day, we'll get to the situation where the, the fare goes up to a dollar a ride, and they're going to find out a, a drop in total revenue. Uh, and then what are they going to do? That's an interesting question. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> <laughs> the, uh, another, another peculiar uh, area of elasticity, uh, and, and which is pretty obvious, I think, among consumers, is movies in New York. As an old movie goer in New York, uh, I've seen a situation develop where nowadays you go to a, I'm not talking now, the, 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 the so called art movies are doing very well, I mean, the, the, the Third Avenue movies and that sort of thing. But the good old neighborhood movies where you have 2,000 seats. Uh, and if you go in there on Saturday night or Friday night or whatever, and five people are sitting in there. <laughs> it's like a private showing. <laughs> uh, <coughs> now, it would seem fairly obvious that at a, at a, at a, at a, at a ticket of three dollars or three fifty, and uh, five people sitting in the theater, it would seem to the, to the movie exhibitor that maybe the thing to do is to cut the price. And, sh and there have been some cases in the last couple of years when the price has been cut, say, to a dollar, a dollar fifty, and lo and behold, the theater is flooded. Obviously, 2,000 people at a dollar and a half a ticket, and it would be an enormous increase in revenue compared to, to you know, five people at three dollars a ticket. But it's an amazing thing how a movie, a movie exhibitors are, uh, don't seem to realize this. It seems it's an elementary lesson in the elasticity of demand. But there, I just say there have been certain cases in neighborhood theaters that adopted a policy of a dollar and a half or a dollar a seat, and bingo, the place is jammed, regardless of the quality of the movie. So that the, one would think, and there's a lesson for any of you who might be own a movie theater in New York, <laughs> cut the price. <laughs> uh, okay, we can begin to use this uh, supply and demand analysis and set, we're to start looking at, at some case studies of, of kinds of prices, individual kinds of prices. Um, there is, for example, a question which is in the, in the minds and hearts of many people in, in the United States. Why is it that the medical and hospital prices have gone up so fantastically? Aside from that, we know, of course, the prices have gone up in general. So we're going to be dealing with a relative question of why prices of medical care have gone enormously up, you know, enormously greater increase than, than regular prices. Uh, <clears throat> and the, again, the answer to this I'm not going to go I'm an expert in the area, but the answer to this, this area can be found by analyzing both the demand side and the supply side. Answer being, there have been various ways in which the demand curve has artificially increased for medical care, thereby, of course, jacking the price up. And there have been ways by which the medical supply of medical services have artificially remained or shifted to the left compared to what they could be or would be, thereby raising the price of medical care that way. So we have an artificial increase in demand, an artificial restriction in supply, the result of an artificial huge increase in price of medical care. <coughs> um, well, for example, uh, it, it has been discovered that the big increase 
And the, the big when, when medical care really took off, strata of the stratosphere, uh, was I think the turn of 66, 67, when they have this big acceleration in, in rate of increase in prices. And before that, before 66, 67, was going up medical medical prices are going up considerably faster than the general cost of living, but that, not that stratospherically. Incidentally, it almost boggles the mind that, you know, that 20 years ago when I first took out Blue Cross, uh, the, cost, the average hospital rate in New York City was $10 a day. It's now something like 200 <laughs> somewhere in that area. Okay, so uh, <coughs> the, uh, the 60, in 66, 67, there was an enormous shift, a uh, breakthrough in the rate of of increase. There was, um, for example, uh, from June 66 to June 67, uh, well, the cost of living was going up by 2.5% approximately that year. Medical care is going up by 10% as compared to 4.5% the previous year. So the doubling of rate of increase. And hospital prices are going up by 25% in that year. So that seems to be uh, uh, the critical point of critical mass, so to speak. And what happened? Did anything happen at 66? Yes, indeed, something happened at 66, namely an enormous infusion of Medicare and Medicaid into the medical health picture. Uh, so what basically has happened, since first of all, since World War II, you we know, have the uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, etc. And since 66, 67, we have an enormous increase in Medicare and Medicaid. The result of which, that was before World War II, almost nobody had medical insurance, maybe 10% or 5% of the population. Now almost everybody's got it. So now they don't let you into the hospital until they see your card, your medical insurance card. Well, the result of this situation is that since everybody, everybody's medical payment is being recouped, either, if not 100%, something close to it, by the insurer, either Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or the government. And of course, the result of this has been an increase in the man curve almost to the stratosphere. So the government then under, underwrites everybody's demand curve for medicine. And since the government underwrites everybody's demand curve for medicine, the result of this, as we should know by this time, is an enormous increase in the price. If, in other words, before, before 1945, people could only afford $100 for an appendix operation, this is what they paid, if now they can afford anything that the government will recoup, $1,000 or something, then why not? Because the taxpayer picks up the tab, and so the doctor then charges the $1,000 instead of 100 <coughs> So this is, <clears throat> with this fantastic increase in the man curve, with, 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 we have almost an un unlimited un underwriting of the consumer demand. Uh, this means the doctor can charge almost unlimited amounts, and the hospital even more so. The hospital is much closer to the, to, uh, the so-called monopoly situation. Uh, a lot of cases where the, the, the medic insurance or Medicaid or Medicare underwrite hospital costs, but not non-hospital costs. So then the effect of this is shove the person to the hospital as quickly as possible and then get the insurance rate. You have a, a shift of medical care toward the hospital because the hospital is an authentic certified thing there and then the government will, will, and insurance will pay it. Uh, and, and, and the peculiar thing is now, after, after so many years of this, all of a sudden the, the medical authorities and the medical profession, medical political profession, have suddenly gotten wise to this. They're saying, hey, maybe there's been a relationship between the Medicare and the price is going up so, so far. You know, by darn, uh, they finally woke it up to this. Instead of finding out from economists what's going to happen, they, they had to learn it through a hard experience. This is the result of this situation. Uh, there's nothing, of course, that the patient public is not really that much better off than medical, Medicare because they have, to, they, either, they have to pay this enormous amount anyway and they make it up through taxes. Uh, that's essentially the demand side, and on the supply side, <clears throat> you have a situation that's been going on for many years, keeping the supply curve drastically to the left. Um, <clears throat> the watershed there was 1910, the black year of 1910, when uh, the Carnegie Endowment Corporation, the Rockefeller Institute, and the General, Rockefeller General Education Board and the American Medical Association co-sponsored the famous Flexner Report. Dr. I forget now it was Abraham Flexner or Simon Abraham Flexner. They're both, both brothers. I think I get them mixed up. Anyway, Dr. Abraham Flexner issued this report on medical education. The report swept the country. He said that there were most medical schools are low quality, and uh, 
They didn't, they didn't meet his high standards, and therefore they should be put out of business through the system of state licensing and medical schools, also hospitals. Medical schools were the key. There were licenses for doctors before this. They weren't that important. This license for medical schools uh, put a stranglehold on medical education. See, the difference, for example, between the bar, the, the bar association and the AMA is this. Uh, you don't have to be, go to a certified law school in order to pass the bar exam. You can't can if you want to be self-educated, be an apprentice to a judge and that sort of stuff, and take the bar examinations that way, like Abraham Lincoln did. Not so many people do it now, but there's still people who do do it, and this is honored by the legal profession. But in the medical profession, you can't just take the, the medical exam. You can't study on your own and be an apprentice to some doctor. You have to go to a certified medical school, certified by the state. Of the, uh, the state appoints the board of licenses, uh, which consists of appointees of the American Medical Association. So what you have is a state partnership of state and American Medical Association running the medical profession in every, in every state. Um, also, this is supposed to be, of course, to ensure quality. Well, we'll get to that on that. The point is that the supply curve is limited tremendously, shifted to the right. Uh, at the time, in 1900, 1905, there were 192 medical schools in the United States. Shortly after that, there were much less. There were, by 1944, there were 69. In other words, there were half the medical schools in the country were put out of business by this process. The state refusing to license these medical schools. Well, uh, and this pushed the supply curve to the left. Number of physicians, 1900, number 157 physicians per 100,000 people. 1957, 132 physicians. That was a, the physician shortage comes about, obviously, through the <coughs> limitation by state licensing procedure. Well, I can say, well, this is a good thing because it's true we have to pay a higher price, but the, the quality is higher because we have these state boards and state diplomates and everything. Well, all right, in the first place, the analogy there, the famous analogy is that is if the government passed a law saying from now on, since the consumer deserve Cadillac automobiles, no less than Cadillacs, we hereby pass a law outlawing all cars that are inferior to, order, to Cadillacs in their construction, horsepower, or whatever. And that would mean, of course, that anybody who had, could afford a, anybody could afford a Cadillac would get to enjoy Cadillac riding. On the other hand, the rest of us would have to walk. In other words, we wouldn't be able to buy cars at all. <coughs> so the, uh, the, so the quality thing is a monopoly gimmick. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a long-standing monopoly gimmick since the 17th century, where the where production is outlawed on the basis of, well, this is a low quality and consumers aren't, don't deserve low quality stuff. Uh, I mean, it's like saying I mean, we should outlaw plastic because really the, you know, the non plastic stuff of the world is much higher quality. In a sense, it is. On the other hand, we might prefer a lower quality, a lower price. Why must I go to a Park Avenue doctor in order to cure my hangnail? Why can't I go to a local, local herb, herb specialist or something <laughs> for, the, for, for, for a dollar instead of having to spend $55 for the Park Avenue physician? So the, the consumer should not be deprived, it seems to me, of a, of a so-called low-quality service uh, if he wants a cheaper product. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, interestingly enough, who was Dr. Abraham Flexner? Dr. Abraham Flexner himself who ran, who decided on all these medical school business. He, he was not a doctor himself, he was not a physician, he was not even a scientist. He was not a medical educator, he owned a prep school down in Maryland. He was a Bachelor of Arts. What gave him, what gives him, what gave him this great power to decide, etc.? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. That's a, that's a teaser. <coughs> <coughs> okay, uh, as a result of this also, we have situations, for example, where you can be a, a licensed qualified physician in New York and go to medical school in New York. If you try to shift to New Jersey, you can't do it because you have to go through the same process in New Jersey. You can't just automatically shift. Again, it's a monopoly situation. The shift of the supply curves to the left. Trying to keep out competition. <coughs> um, there are other processes involved here. One of the one of the processes that, as we'll see later on, with price control, the rent controls, etc. The uh, if, you, if you give the producers power over the, the market, over the supply, uh, this means that you have all sorts of much much more room for discrimination than you had before. Because in other words, if you give the building superintendent the power to allocate uh, apartments. Rather than the price system, it means that the superintendent is going to allocate them according to the race or religion he prefers. The same thing happened in medical school. You have to create this artificial shortage of space, spaces in medical school. The result is you had a much, much greater increase of discrimination against, for example, Negro, uh, Jewish, and female applicants. So that the number 
the number of female doctors dropped considerably. Uh, there were much fewer female physicians. I mean, absolute number, not just per thousand people. Much fewer women physicians in 1940 than there were in 1910. So you had this, this crackdown then on the so-called minority groups as a result of this, of giving a power over the supply of the service to the occupation of the profession itself. Uh, in other words, they give them the power to ration spaces. <clears throat> and you have situations where people who were, couldn't get into medical school, which would be absurd because a lot of, in other words, people who are intelligent and good grades could get into law school but could not get into medical school. Again, the reason was that there was a tremendous shortage, an artificially created shortage of supply, and people used to go to Switzerland and try to get an MD there and try desperately to come back here and so forth and so on. All this is a result of this artificial restriction. Uh, another thing about quality is, <coughs> excuses of course the quality of the consumer who needs high quality medical care is being protected. However, in every one of these cases, not just of course for physicians, but also for barbers and everything, photographers and every other licensing law, there's always a so-called grandfather clause which is true in the medical profession too, exempting existing doctors from, this, from, these, from these requirements. In other words, uh, when the thing was passed in 1910, that you have to go to such and such a medical school to be a licensed physician, this did not apply to Joe Blow who might have been a, gotten a phony degree in, in, in car washing or something, and you know, is, is, is committing surgery in public. <laughs> he could, could continue doing this until the age of 80 without any problem at all. So the fact that, that uh, the so-called quality quality uh, protection of the consumer never applies to existing people in the profession, either doctors or photographers or whatever, seems to point very clearly to the conclusion that the object of this whole thing is monopoly and restriction rather than worrying about the consumer. The consumer is the last person to be worried about in this, in this situation. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, and of course, there's no recertification procedure, so the doctor can probably forget everything he knew back when he went to Bellevue and not read anything for the next 50 years, and nobody does anything about him. This so-called quality guidance never somehow applies to him. Uh, there's another aspect of this, which I don't want to get too, too much into, which is price discrimination, where the, the, because of the monopoly element in medical schools and hospitals, uh, the hospital-connected physicians are able to soak the rich. In other words, they're able to charge much higher prices for the same service to rich patients than they are, they are to poorer patients. This is done again in the name of humanitarianism. That's all bushwalk by humanitarianism. The point is that uh, there, there are plenty of free clinics. There's nothing to do with the problem of free clinic. This is a, this is a point where uh, a surgeon, for example, can charge five times as much for an appendectomy to a rich person as he does to a, a poorer person. A dentist doesn't do this usually. That is more or less the same price. Psychoanalysts don't do that either because Dentists and psychoanalysts are not hospital oriented. The closer you get to the hospital, the closer you get to the monopoly, the source of monopoly power in the state licensing of hospitals and medical schools. And so there's been studies of this showing that, that those physicians, those medical practices which are not hospital oriented, do not price discriminate, do not soak the rich, whereas uh, those that are hospital oriented do. <coughs> Particularly surgeons and anesthesiologists. And if we know it's not an accident that the surgeons are total control of the AMA, for example. There's not one, I don't think there's not, there's not one officer of the American Medical Association who's not a surgeon. It's not an accident because the surgeons are the closest to the source of monopoly power. They're, they're only hospital oriented. Uh, <coughs> by price discrimination, I mean this, that the, usually people cannot price discriminate. For example, uh, if, if Rockefeller, first of all, Rockefeller loves Wheaties, and I'm a Wheaties salesman. You know, I see Rockefeller walking in, and I charge him $5,000 for a box. Why not? He can afford it. But the point is that he can then hi, he can hire somebody else. He can hire a stooge to come in and buy for the usual 35 cents or whatever. And he, and, or, or he can buy it from, you know, on a black market, a black Wheaties market on the street. So competition will usually eliminate the, the possibility of soaking the rich on the market. But in the medical profession, especially the hospitally oriented medical profession, there are various ways, such as this, such as state licensing of hospitals to prevent this. In particular, um, all sorts of ways of so uh, one, one area, for example, econ economists will always say to watch out. Whenever a, whenever a profession has a special code of ethics, I mean, usually there's, there's just one code of ethics for people, golden rule or whatever. Whenever you have a profession that has special ethics, like photographer's ethics, watch out because monopoly is at work. Fleecing of the public is at work. 
The so-called medical ethics are part of this. The so-called me medical ethics, for example, are somehow unesthetic or immoral to advertise. What this means is unesthetic or immoral compete with, with your fellow doctors, take business away from them, cut prices, and so forth. Uh, it's not immoral to advertise Blue Cross. Blue Cross can advertise full page ads in the Times all over the place, and the medical profession loves it. Why? Because this increases the demand curve for all the doctors. Whereas, if one physician or group of physicians advertises, this will cut into the demand of others, and this is nasty and competitive. You don't want, you don't want competition that will cut prices and benefit the consumers. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> all right, getting, by, getting back to the Flexner report, and where, why Flexner got all this power, even though he was not a physician, a medical educator, or a scientist, and why he was able to put half of the medical schools in the country out of business. His brother was Dr. Simon Flexner, head of the Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research. Um, and I say he was sponsored, his research was sponsored by Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundation. The, um, the Carnegie and uh, the Rockefeller Institute had a certain bias, technological, scientific, ideological bias, and in, in, in physical medical therapy. I don't want to get into the medical therapy area. I don't want to start defending one therapy against another. I do want to say that uh, there's a certain in, in, innate bias of the Rockefeller Institute uh, for drug, synthetic drug therapy. Uh, for example, Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research is constantly sponsoring synthetic drugs, or new, new synthetic drugs, uh, on the market. Okay, uh, fair enough. However, there was in 1910, before the Flexner Report, two competing kinds of medical care, each of which was equally respectable, I might add. Allopathy, which is now called medicine, <coughs> and homeopathy, which was a completely different kind of doctrine, which said instead of giving synthetic drugs, you should give teeny doses, very, very teeny doses of natural herbs. Uh, that, the, the economic point here is that synthetic drugs are extremely expensive, as we all know, and also have a beautiful feel for profit and manufacture. Natural herbs, however, are very, very cheap, especially with small doses, and extremely inexpensive and not much room for profit anywhere. The, uh, the, the medical schools were put out of business by the Flexner Report were mostly homeopathic schools. We have a point now where it's almost impossible to find a homeopathist, homeopathist? homeopathist under the age of 75 because there ain't no medical schools in homeopathy. <coughs> So if you want to find a homeopathic practitioner, you have to look high and low, and he's you know, often half dead. But uh, we are prevented from enjoying the possible benefits of homeopathy by the by savage, I should say, compulsory outlawing of homeopathic, med homeopathic medicine. Uh, also, of course, uh, we've seen the medical profession turn against other competing therapies like acupuncture, try to outlaw that, and so forth. Uh, the punchline here again is that the Rockefeller family uh, is heavily invested in synthetic drug products, uh, synthetic, synthetic drug companies. And might or might not be a connection there between, <coughs> between the fact that the Rockefeller Foundation sponsors and Rockefeller Institute sponsors uh, research which puts the competing allopathists, uh, competing homeopaths out of business and then, uh, and then pushes allopathy through fairly well. So what I'm saying is that the consumers are not only deprived of the, of the cheap, the cheap herb specialists, he's also deprived, he's also deprived of competing therapies, which may or may not be uh, workable, because of the, the total power given the AMA allopathy. We're, we're totally deprived of an enormous number of other competing possibilities, which could be, could be there, and which uh, free market might pop up in the free market, which are outlawed out of existence. The uh, cobiazin has been outlawed. The interstate commerce, oxy. Uh, therapy for cancer is that one, and so forth and so on. Uh, even, <coughs> even crazy old Wilhelm Reich was, spent his last years in jail because of a, the outlawing organ therapy, which is, which is a, a Food and Drug Administration accused of being fraudulent. Uh, it might, might, work, might well have been incorrect, but certainly it seems to me the consumers have the right to try it anyway. The poor old Reich uh, was, was jailed because he, had, he, he insisted on renting his organ boxes out for uh, therapy. And the FDA said they don't work and it's, uh, they're fraudulent, therefore you're, you're hereby sent to prison. Well, all this is <coughs> methods by which orthodox medicine restricts the supply of the profession, increases the demand for it, restricts competition within it, especially in hospital based areas, and uh, 
outlaws any sort of uh, competing approaches. Uh, thereby we see, well, we see not only how to find a man is influenced by government action, we also see how, we also see what the problem monopoly really is. We'll get back to that later on, but it's a core monopoly. The problem monopoly is always government. It's always government getting in there, restricting supply, uh, and pushing prices up. 